As an academic, can I just say um, congratulations and well done to MSF for the huge effort and seriousness with which you take research. Um, the research you conduct is not only important and useful for informing your own programs, but it's a crucial part of bearing witness to what is going on. Um, publicizing and exposing the ugly side of humanity, and that's undoubtedly an important part of MSF's mission. You've provided two great case studies in terms of the research that we heard. Um, one was really a case study of what Johann Galtung first described and Paul Farmer then popularized as structural violence. These are the social and economic arrangements that cause harm. And then with the Syria case study, we saw another form of violence, the more direct, immediate, physical, eruptive violence. Both are case studies of violence. Um, my, so I, I want to kind of lead off by, by asking the first question, which is, in your recommendations, you, you gave recommendations about how you can respond to the consequences of this violence. But can I press you? for recommendations for how MSF can engage with the prevention of this violence in both cases. Kind of following on from Adil's final statement about us needing to think and talk about prevention. That's the first question. And I'm gonna open up to the floor for a couple of other questions. One here. Ready? Yeah, hi. Hello, I'm, I'm Adam from MSF. Um, it's a question to Larissa. I wonder if, the, if you have or if there are any plans to link the results of the research to some of the projects that have been going on in home societies in Sweden and in Belgium, for example, doing mental health assessment of the refugees that have made it that far, and to see whether the results that you have coincide or if there are fundamental changes or differences between your results and for those people that have made it to perhaps safer havens. Thank you. Another question? Got one over there. Yes. Thank you. This is Olympia from Save the Children. Again, may I make two short questions? Um, one would be to Michelle. Michelle, uh, it's regarding referral pathways in your program because I saw that there was at least one child of 13 years. So, I mean, this must be illegal even in Bangladesh. So, were you? referring this or advocating against this? And did you think that there could be more illegal child workforce in those settings that are not accessing healthcare? And then the question to Larissa, um, thank you. Um, it is, did you also assess some of the coping mechanisms I agree that it's necessary to scale up MHPSS services, but context is so terrible that sometimes we struggle to know what could work better. So you are providing a very good analysis of which are the problems, but I don't know if there is some part in your study like uh, trying to identify which uh, work we can build upon <laughs> in order to have more impactful uh, interventions on mental health. Thank you. Thanks. Do you want to take those questions? And then we'll do one more round of questions, and I think that will be it for the <coughs> session. Yes, uh, sorry. can you hear me? Yes, thank you. <laughs> yes, regarding the referral strategy, I think this is one of the strategies that we have been uh, discussing over and over and about our role of advocacy, especially when we see that there are lots of minors, especially being employees and being able to, I mean, being working in this very uh, uh, hazardous conditions. So for the referral pathway, we have established a uh, network of referrals, um, especially with the protection agencies and also have a link with the bigger referral hospitals and we do support them in uh, such referrals. And this is also more true for our other health programs like SGBV and uh, SRH, where we do have the link with the other hospitals. Thank you for your question. Um, no, so I haven't, we haven't compared our results with the, um, I think that was your question, I'm not sure I understood it um, properly, but um, you asked if we compared it with the situation among refugees that are um, in Europe, right? Yeah, so no, um, we didn't do that. Um, I just like read some, some studies about um, mental health distress among these communities, 
and um, the estimates we found are, are, are similar. Um, then for the, the other question, so no, unfortunately we didn't uh, dig deeper in the, um, in the coping mechanism or, or we just wanted to have like um, uh, an overview of what was happening and, and where were the, um, the problems. Sydney, you want to respond to any of the questions or? Uh, <laughs> uh, your question around <coughs> prevention, um, just to clarify, prevention in terms of the underlying causes for the crisis. Prevention of violence. Well, that's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I think many have said it already. I mean, our, 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 our primary role is, is to respond, is to provide that immediate, that immediate uh, um, care, the unmet need that we see in front of us. But with the data that we have, with the information that we collect, with the testimonies that we collect, we have a responsibility to expose. Um, through that information, um, either um, behind closed doors or publicly, um, we engage uh, uh, on that side of the advocacy. But, but, but the, the challenge, the call is, is to the global community, is to the organizations, is to the governments with the responsibility to be engaged, to actually act. Um, and, and clearly that's, that, that's one of the things we saw with the, uh, with the uh, current Rohingya crisis. Uh, it's not a good answer to what you've, what you've asked. It's not an easy question. <laughs> Mitchell, did you want to? Uh, uh, sorry, I think I missed the second point about the role of advocacy in our population like Kamarangicha. This is something that we have been struggling, uh, to be honest. Uh, like uh, we, uh, like we are in this phase where now we have the data to show that yes, there is this marginalized populations. But at the same time, that like we need to balance our access to these uh, factories. So right now, uh, we are more focused in developing the model of care, and now the focus is on building the network to see how we can use the data that we have analyzed uh, to be able to improve the working conditions. And when we talk about advocacy, we are looking at both the internal advocacy for the, with the factory owners, and then we also try to define the advocacy strategy to the external uh, actors. Do we have time for another? Yeah. Parker, you've got someone. So um, a question from our online, well, two questions from the online audience for Mitchell. Um, one is that uh, our viewers were surprised by the low percentage of women um, that, that were documented as working in these factories, given that sort of the, the image, the typical image of, of factory, uh, especially garment workers, is of women. So just a question about how the sample was taken. Is it possible that this uh, female workforce is even more um, invisible? And secondly, a question about, is there a tension when you go into these factories and you see child workers? Um, how, how is the tension when you're sort of documenting and, and, and conducting the survey, but knowing that these are children working there? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the second question, please? About attention um, about when you see child workers in these factories and you're documenting what they do and the, the, their health illnesses and things, is there, uh, but knowing that these are children working in, in, in very perilous conditions? Thank you. Um, for the uh, distributions of the uh, for the woman, uh, I think like we cannot show here in the like more in-depth analysis. But if you look at the type of workers, even divide them into different uh, categories, like especially on the uh, the factories type, we can see that uh, like in metals, in tanneries, where it involves much more uh, like physical uh, work, that you have much more employments of the male. But this is but if you look at the gar factories like garment industries, I think there is where the majority of the women's um, workers constitute. And uh, second for, for the second questions, I think it is very difficult questions, like yes, uh, like especially knowing that we are seeing this type of conditions, but uh, to define like what would be the, the emotions, has, it's a very human factor that yes, we go there, we see this type of conditions, but uh, at the same time, like uh, we do need to protect the importance and access to these factories. So what we do, what we could, is talk about this condition to the factory owners. But when it comes to change, I think it's very difficult because we also have to remember that these children are the some of are the only earning members of some of the families. So by coming strongly against the ch child 
labor, we may also end up cutting off the economic, um, economic uh, support for the family. Great, thank you, Mitchell. I'm really sorry, but we've run out of time. Um, I feel bad, I've been a very bad chair. I haven't been strict enough. Uh, um, can I just say, we've covered a huge amount of ground, lots of issues. Um, unfortunately, a lot of it has been quite depressing. Um, some of it is a bit frightening. Um, but I always go back to Antonia Gramsci, who talks about the importance of being pessimistic with the mind, but hopeful with the heart. Um, and that's how we must go forward, with the mind and with the heart. Um, Thank you very much for allowing me to be part of your scientific conference. Um, I've never worked for MSF, but I feel like I belong to MSF. Um, I feel like I'm part of the wider family. Um, 